Good morning. This is Steve from the Fairfield Seventh-day Adventist Church, which is completely empty today. So you have my undivided attention. We just finished a remote Sabbath school this morning with our church gathering on Skype. Uh, and I was surprised how easily we adapted to our new environment. It was a good time together. So today, I thought that I would talk about something if I can get this going here. Okay, I would talk about a current event rather than continuing on our with our series. Um, COVID-19, which is the official name, Coronavirus Disease 2019, uh, as always, we come up with acronyms in, in the scientific world, and COVID-19 and the end of the world. Wuhan is the capital of the largest province in central China, which is the homeland of China. The, the, central, the central population point and cultural point. And Wuhan is a town of, get this, 10 million people. That's larger than New York City, which only comes in around 8 million and is the largest city in the United States. And Wuhan is number nine in, in the lineup of the largest cities in China. Wuhan is also the um, economic, transportation, and educational hub for central China. It has been dubbed by Western journalists the Chicago of China because the of all of the transportation lines that center there. <clears throat> when you look over the city, you see modern transportation, you see modern housing developments, there are skyscrapers, green spaces. Yes, there are cultural elements that tell me this is not the United States, but this is not a primitive setting. <clears throat> Green spaces and, and uh, office complexes, public parks. They just finished hosting an international sports um, event in the city. More importantly, it's the home of people, people like you and I people with vibrant lives. And so in January, when Wuhan basically became the epicenter of a med medical disaster zone, the world stood by in confusion. Uh, medical authorities were saying, what's going on? Something's going on. If somebody dropped the ball, this could not be happening. This should not be happening. This would not be happening if it was in our country. And then the virus spread. <clears throat> and today, <laughs> well, yesterday the world shut down. International air travel is being restricted. Borders have are, are closing left and right all across Europe, Middle East, Asia, the United States. Why? Is this panic? Well, a degree of it may be panic, a degree of it may be politically motivated, but more importantly, okay, this graphic is, is out of New Zealand and it explains why we are responding so graphically. Okay. This line here, is the health system capacity. How many seriously ill patients the health system can take care of? If a virus spreads rapidly, 
and the number of people who need intensive care, ventilators, intensive nursing, exceeds the capacity of the healthcare system, what happens? Well, I can tell you in China and today in Italy, what is happening is that doctors are having to prioritize who gets care. In Italy, they are prioritizing those who are most likely to recover, which translates those who are younger. So you may not feel vulnerable. I may not feel vulnerable. My wife has been trying to make me feel vulnerable. I may not feel vulnerable, but taking the attitude, whatever, it's just like a cold or, or something else. Okay. Yes, it is a cold, but this is a cold that kills. And so taking the, the recommended precautions, washing our hands, reducing social interaction, staying away from large gatherings of people, all of these things are important and prudent. Now Christians at times like this tend to, rep to repeat this Bible text to themselves. Thou shalt not be afraid of the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. Sir, you can come in and join. It's okay. We just had a visitor walk into church, and he is welcome, okay? Sorry. We're, we're worshiping remotely yeah, today. Yeah, I figured that. I didn't know that. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. So, <clears throat> well, I find this passage meaningful, but when Christians invoke it and say, I don't need to worry, this won't happen to me, I think we're taking a simplistic approach because the Bible presents a much more balanced picture than I don't have to worry about the bad things that are happening around me. So what do Christians have to fall back on? I'll just share my own experience, okay? These are the anchors that I hold on to when fear stalks my heart. Number one, I live within the context of eternity. We're programmed as humans to think of life as a one-way journey. Three score and 10. 60, 70 years, maybe 90, 100 if we're really lucky and have blessed with good parents. But that's not what the Bible presents. Jesus said, I came to bring eternal life. And those who believe on me, even if they die, they will live forever. So about halfway through my life, I started exercising living from the perspective of eternity, which meant I no longer felt the pressure of, I gotta get everything done today because I might die tomorrow. It also means that as my life has gone on and I've gotten older and you know parts have started stopped working uh, as well as they used to, or I start to have limitations or my dreams aren't fulfilled. It means that I don't feel like I'm a failure and that life is meaningless and hopeless because my life stretches on into an unseeable future. So when Lazarus died, Jesus told his sister Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. And whoever believes on me will never die. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? That's basically the question we as Christians have to ask ourselves. Are we living life within the context of three score and 10? Are we measuring our success and the meaning of our life based on what we've achieved and what we think we can achieve in that time frame, Or are we living in the context of eternity? I would suggest that in times like this, eternity creates a perspective 
that helps us to avoid panic and fear. The second is what I call my ABBA experience. When I was a young man, I spent about 10 years as a Christian debating with myself whether Christianity was real or not. Today, people call that being an agnostic. I don't know, I'm not certain. Well, I spent 10 years in, in, that, in that arena, but every morning when I woke up, just as I woke up, I had this sense of God leaning over my bed and looking down on me like a father checking on his child in the morning. That was one of the anchor of my spiritual experience at that time. That was what kept the hope alive for me that God was real, despite everything that I was told by my society. In Romans, Paul wrote, For we have not received the spirit of bondage, again, to fear, but we've received the spirit of adoption, whereby we call, we cry, Abba, which in Aramaic was the familiar term akin to daddy. For much of my life now, Abba has been my father. And because Abba is my father and he cares for me, when I go into situations like what we're facing right now, I know I'm not alone. I'll never be abandoned. I may not see him, he may be walking invisibly beside me. Bad things may happen in my life, but that does not mean that my father does not care. And third is the assurance that suffering will end. And I'm not about talking about suffering will end when I'm dead. I'm talking about suffering, period. The happy ending to the Bible is not a storm cloud. The happy ending to the Bible is sunrise, which brings us to the end of the world. The Bible describes the world at the end of time as falling apart. The sun is too hot. Nature is disintegrating around us. Disease and disaster are raging around the globe. War and oppression abound. And just when it appears that the world is going to self-destruct or we are going to destroy it, God steps in and brings the whole sad affair to a crashing halt. Now, during my agnostic years, this was not especially an appealing picture. I wanted to believe in humanity's ability to solve their problems. It's what fueled my political angst, made me want to change the world. At this, this end of my life, I've come to the conclusion that no matter how hard we try, injustice is always going to be there. When you look back over the last 200 years of progress, we have made progress. We have improved the world. But would you say we have eliminated injustice, inequity, abuse? Not on our lives. So for me, it is hopeful to know that we are promised in the Bible a God who is going to bring all of us. Is COVID-19 the end of the world? I don't think so. But I do think that it's a wake-up call. <clears throat> I think it's a reminder of how quickly global events can occur, how quickly governments and even societies can turn on a dime and do things that just a week ago they thought unthinkable. How fragile the security of our civilization is. And my suggestion to you today, my plea to you today, is listen. Jesus said, whoever is thirsty, come to the water. Whoever has no money, even if you have none, come, buy and eat. Buy wine and milk. You don't have to pay for it. It's free. Why do you spend money and thirst after what can't nourish you? 
Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. And that's all I have to say today. Be well, be prudent, and fear not, for there is a God who cares about you. Have a good day.